So I'm just going to share my screen just uh, to orient us all to uh, coming in. And who's taking notes today beside me? Um, I am. My name's Haley. I'll be taking notes as well, Michelle. Haley. Okay. Awesome. It's a collective effort, these, uh, the note taking. Uh, okay, I'm just going to share my screen. And I have to move stuff over again. Oh, hang on a second here. Okay, that's why. As we're all getting ready. One. And that's why my camera was supposed to be. Oops. Okay. Just so you all know, my camera is in front where the where the slide deck is for me. And you're all beside on a second screen. So, so I'm lucky enough to have two screens. Okay, so if we're all here, if those of you who cannot share your uh, facial features, uh, if you can give us a thumbs up that you're there, If you know how to do that with your um, Zoom screen on the bottom. Yeah, Ramona's there. Okay, Farrell, I know you're there. Haley, I heard you already. You're there, yeah. Carol. I'm here, thank you. Great, okay. So, Kisa Kwitlam Kapiniskis, we're going to start this session almost on time. Uh, good morning to you all. Uh, welcome and thank you. Uh, first of all, I'm going to turn it over to uh, your, um, where is he, president, uh, Patrick Steiner. Uh, and I just have the agenda up there. So, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen while Patrick uh, does his thing. Thanks, Michelle. Hi, everybody, and welcome. Glad that so many of us are here uh, for this visioning session and uh, sharing session that we're doing today. Um, I think most of you know me, but if you don't, I'm Patrick, and I'm the chair of the board of the Food Policy Council. And I want to start off by acknowledging that this land that we're on here, um, that I love living in, um, this the, the land of the chickadee, as it was called by uh, Masukin Joe Pierre that uh, joined us recently is the unceded and the stolen and the traditional lands of Indigenous people who've lived here, um, including the Tanaha, the Sayoks, and the Sanaikst. And I'm very happy that Michelle is joining us and, and leading us through this process today. With that, uh, Michelle, welcome. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, and I'm just going to share my screen again uh, and share with you the agenda for today. So, uh, first of all, uh, yep, my name is Michelle Sam. I am Tanaka. I live in my homelands uh, of Amakus Tanaka. I'm a 60s scoop kid. Uh, I own my own business, and now I'm also a faculty member up at the College of the Rockies, uh, designing, developing, and um, uh, delivering Indigenous people's uh, content uh, and looking at a whole bunch of different things. So I want to appreciate um, and reach out to Abra, uh, who's going to be a participant today, uh, for reaching out to me and asking me to support um, the Food Policy Council in your work. And so this is, I put together this, uh, this little agenda and hopefully we'll get through it in the, in the two hours and it's mostly interactive. So our purpose is to envision the continued growth of your policy, the Central Kootenai Food Policy Council as an entity. You'll see that I'm not using acronyms. Uh, and I, over the last couple of months, I've really moved away from acronyms uh, and for a whole bunch of different reasons. And we might even talk about that later on in the session. Uh, but one of the reasons is indigenous languages. 
uh, and the fact that indigenous languages are for the most part uh, suffering uh, from uh, you know, all of the traumas and, and so on and so forth. And yet at the same time, the education, uh, the Western education is also suffering. And so when we're using acronyms, what ends up happening is that there is a mix mash of, of understanding and sometimes our shared understandings and our meaning making are limited by not knowing in which way we're defining um, the use of acronyms and the use of big words. And so, um, so first we're gonna do a review. Uh, thanks to Abra, uh, I, I, I asked her for a timeline um, for us to all review uh, over the last five years. And so I've got some slides to that. The next thing we're going to do, which you're gonna be like, what? Uh, and then we're gonna do some introductions. And so the introductions themselves, what I'm gonna ask you uh, to take a minute, just a quick minute and tell us your name, your um, preferred pronouns, if you so choose, uh, your position or your affiliation, what organization you're with. One thing the Central Kootenai Food Policy Council did over the last past five years that you're proud of and why, uh, and also your favorite food. So Tunaha are very context specific. Our language is very specific. And we have a term, akpitsis. And what that is, is uh, a favorite food. And it's species specific. So every species has a food. And so I'm doing a lot of work right now with diet study and, and um, bioethnobotany and so on and so forth. And it looks like we have a Smurf, um, the Kootenai Co-op. <laughs> we have a Smurf joining us this morning. Yay! Um, that's exciting. Uh, and um, so I would like you to, if you have a favorite food, to share that with us as well. Then we're going to move into a bit of a presentation on um, some things to consider. Then we're going to do a round of check-in. So very interactive. This is purposely very interactive. I, I want to hear uh, from all of you uh, to be able to think about where, where you're heading and, and what are some of the thoughts that you're having. Uh, and then we'll talk about our next steps as well. Okay, sounds good? Thumbs up? Yeah? Have you all had your coffee? Are you all ready? Are you all happy? Yay! Okay, that makes it really easy to do this kind of work. Um, so let me just see if I can change my slide here. Uh, so some of you, this will be familiar for you because you've participated in a different conversation in a different place with me uh, and just talking about important dialogues. And so uh, understanding the differences uh, in sometimes, you know, when we, we start to participate in, in group dynamics and having Indigenous people in the room, we kind of change things, uh, you know, sometimes on purpose and sometimes not, just sometimes by our mere presence of who we are and how we are in, in, in the room. And so I'm not sure how many of you have ever had a, a, an opportunity to be facilitated by an Indigenous person. Hands up if you have. Hands up if it's not me. Awesome. And did you notice any sort of changes? Yes or no, right? In differences, right? Trying to be place-based, trying to um, support that reconciliation work means that the, the dynamics change and how we might do things might change. So uh, asking everybody, right, with good hearts, come together with good hearts um, and minds. I have no, no um, question that we all have good hearts and uh, to suspend our disbelief and think about who's speaking for how long, right? Especially when we go through our introductions, because I'm sure you all have a lot to say. Uh, also use the chat. I see somebody's already um, put something into the chat. Uh, so that's just Abra and letting us know that we are recording, which is really great. And hopefully you will watch the recording afterwards if you, you know, as you're thinking through some stuff. Um, yeah, so. What I did was I took Abra's beautiful timeline, uh, and the reason I asked her for a timeline is what I understood is that we were looking back and looking forward, and quite often uh, when we're trying to vision, it's really important to understand where did we come from, what have we been doing, uh, and what do we want to continue to do. So keep in mind those questions for you, right, about the things that you're proud 
uh, of what you've accomplished thus far. And so I'm not going to read these. Um, hopefully you can all see them. I did send it to Amy, this, this PowerPoint slide deck, and, and uh, so you will get a PDF version of it. Can you all read that? Is that is, can you all see that okay? Yeah? Okay. And I'm a really big one for thumbs up because um, sometimes people nod very quietly. <laughs> okay, awesome. Yay, good, good, good. Uh, so 2015, 2015. Uh, so, and you'll notice that I italicized certain, certain uh, words, action words, right? So training, decision, create, collaborate, hire, right? These are all activities that you have been involved in. Uh, and and uh, we're good. I'll go to 2016. Yep, see nodding faces, okay. Funding secured, uh, hired to coordinate, advisory committee established, uh, consulted to guide council mandates, governance matrix created uh, to help ensure that diverse voices right, are involved, sorry, I didn't get that one involved, um, participate, uh, terms of reference, and your website created. These all seem familiar? Yeah, okay. 2017, this is where it's like, oh my God, now we have like continuations, right? <laughs> I couldn't even get it all onto one, one PowerPoint slide deck. Good for you. Uh, and then I thought, oh, should I just take out a bunch of words? And I was like, no, I'm going to leave it all in. Um, out of respect for all of the work that you have done as a collective. And so you have your meetings that start to get regulated, right? You're, you're doing on a regular basis. Um, you're establishing reports. Uh, executive committee now, uh, your food systems literacy program, educational sessions, presentations, national, it looks like national to me and regional. Uh, mentoring and advice, uh, creation of case study, awesome, and secured funding created the foundation. And so for myself as somebody who is coming in really, really new and, and just going, okay, so who are you and what do you do? Uh, let me just say I'm really impressed. Um, very good, like pat on the back, high five all of you. Like that's just 2017 not even the full year, right? So created a logic model for evaluation and guiding your work, collaborating, uh, liaison, uh, funding plans, and becoming a society within the province of BC. 2018, right? So meetings again, making sure that you're having meetings, you're continuing some of the programming you developed. Uh, field trips is added in, which I thought, ooh, this is, this is kind of neat. Um, the training and storytelling, the first annual farm and food directory was published, uh, creating the policy and law, right, the, the primer, uh, again, case study, and then hiring another staff member, um, and uh, having an advisory member on to the regional, right, health, uh, interior health food security network um, research project, and so you're doing a lot of a lot, a lot, a lot of work. Um, and so this is pretty awesome. Uh, 2019, again, you're continuing on with the work and the directions that you undertook in the first place uh, that you're building up now. Continuing field trips, continuing education, providing content. Um, I think there were presentations. Uh, your publications are continuing and you're developing more policy uh, frame. All this seems familiar? Yeah, okay. Continuing with presentations at the national and I think it's the national, municipal and regional and provincial levels. Uh, and the two year evidence-based food policy development project. And I'm not sure if that was a continu continuation of the research from the previous year or not. Um, but we can have that conversation. But it based, and then you added in here now the water issues, right? So beginning to uh, formulate around water issues. And then 2020, this is what I find really interesting, is that there is a an ideology out there that when COVID hit, uh, we all stopped working. 
And my own experience has been, and witnessing a lot of other people, is that when COVID hit, people actually got busier and have been busier in 2021 as well, because not only are we doing the work that we normally do, we are also doing work where we're translating it to technology, right? We're relying more and more on technology to do some of the work. So how many of you are dealing with uh, Zoom burnout? Excellent, okay, well, hopefully I won't contribute to that today, um, but it's a real thing. Uh, that's part of the reason why I always ask people to turn on their cameras. Um, and there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of research being done around how to mitigate Zoom's burnout. And part of that is interaction, right? Part of that is putting the responsibility back on folks to like read and um, also contribute to conversations uh, as well as to have cameras on because then you're not doing as many other things. Uh, which is actually part of the burnout is trying to do two or three different things and the brain is not developed to do so right multitasking is 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 actually a lie we, we can't do it um, look at any two-year-old that gets uh, upset when they're trying to do too many things uh, so apologies for the digression right but you've got your third annual farm and food directory pub published now uh, you're engaging more, it looks like, with local governance, right, uh, municipal government. Uh, you're doing events still. You're um, working around COVID and the impacts of COVID. Uh, and the advisory is now moving into community futures. Um, I wasn't sure about the load board, uh, Abra, but that was what was in it. And so I thought maybe it was an acronym or, or maybe it's not. And, and I just left that in there. So if it's a spelling, we can talk about that later and, and I'll, I can fix that for you. Um, you know, expanding into, into understanding better cannabis, right, as, as, a, as a harvest. And do, 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 hired a communication coordinator. Hi, Amy. Right. So now you have three staff and you're not done. <laughs> this is like the biggest, the most populated year um, of, of, of content was 2020. Uh, so, you know, this I found interesting, the systemic racism and food systems training, right? So you started to branch out and up and through. You have a blog now happening um, and you are working with the various different levels of government. So in a nutshell. Uh, okay, in 2021, again, uh, furthering your agendas, right, further clarifying your agendas. So you're meeting, you're starting to look at, okay, what does this look like for us uh, as, as a group if we take on this, these, you know, this idea of having those diverse lens, uh, continuing your publications, I think I already said that, French translations, woohoo, yay, that's exciting, um, localized or re- so I wasn't 100% sure what this was, but I'm hoping you all know. Created Relocalized Food Systems Action Grid. And so I was like, ooh, that sounds very interesting. Um, and then again, continuing your presentations, mentoring students, including graduate students, uh, and um, supporting the cannabis sector, and submissions to government on policies. And that's where we are. So. Quickly, if you wanna just take a note for yourself, I'm gonna stop sharing as we go around, but this is what I would like us each to take a minute to do. So introduce yourself, your name, your pronoun, if you prefer, uh, your position, your affiliation. One thing, and I know I went very quickly, but hopefully you have a, have a memory of one thing that the Central Kootenai Food Policy Council did over the last past five years, you're really proud of and why as well as your favorite food. Okay, sounds good? Nodding heads, yeah, okay. Yes, no, maybe, okay. All right, let me stop sharing. So how we're gonna do this is, uh, I'm gonna pick somebody and you're going to go for first. And then when you're done, you're just gonna pick somebody on the list, hopefully somebody you don't know, okay? And we're going to keep going until everybody's had, had a chance to speak. Sound good? Okay, hey, I'm going to pick uh, Lynn. Lynn Short, you can go first. 
Uh, good morning, everybody. I, um, just give me a nod if you can hear me. I'm playing with technology this morning. Perfect. Good. Thank you. I, I wear a couple hats. I'm a business management consultant specializing in HR and operations. I tend to work with very, very small companies right up to small business. Uh, so under 100 employees. Uh, revisiting my passions these days uh, for farming, agriculture in general, and food production. So that's what's brought me to, um, to you folks and your group. And uh, it's extremely interesting and something I think is extremely timely. So I'm over in the Arrow Lakes area, just outside of Nacusp and north of uh, Vernon, uh, north of uh, Burton. And uh, it's where we call home. We have a small farm, a market garden stand. Uh, it's manned. Uh, and we have uh, market gardens. We're experimenting with different crops like hops, um, possibly some hemp. Uh, and some root vegetables, potatoes, sweet potatoes, that kind of stuff. So it keeps us busy. I, I'm new to the council, so I can't really comment on something I'm proud of uh, for the last five years of contribution, except that you folks have done a tremendous job. And uh, I guess I should call it right there and um, pass this on to Carol. Thank you very much, Lynn. My name's Carol Hebden, and I'm joining you from uh, the unceded territories of the Sequemic people, known as Sequemic Ulu. I'm into Kamloops, uh, Kamloops, and I am the past president of the Kamloops Food Policy Council. Um, and I've been on the board there for about seven years, and I've stepped off the board lately, and I'm a member now. Um, and happy to turn things over to much younger and more energetic um, individuals. However, I keep my food, my fingers very much in uh, the work of the Food Policy Council here and the, our food system, which is more and more uh, vulnerable as time um, goes by and climate change amps up and up. I am a long time uh, admirer of Abra Brin and the work that she has done provincially, nationally, and now within your regional district of Central Kootenai. Um, Kamloops Food Policy Council has um, its origins at the municipal level, and the aspirations are to be um, more, more proactive at a regional level and partnering with uh, Thompson Nicola Regional District um, to do that work. We do have a, a regional food hub that we are well into um, establishing here. And we are working quite closely with um, Community Futures Development Corporation uh, of Central Interior First Nations, George Casimir, in the development of um, Quisalt and uh, Mobile Food Kitchen uh, that goes to rural Indigenous communities for processing and um, started as well um, the Quisalton Farmers Market, a very um, successful initiative. Uh, so we have a lot of, we're 25 year old Food Policy Council here in Kamloops with much to learn. And when I saw the notice from ABRA that this event was taking place, it occurred to me that, that um, I would really benefit so I'm here to benefit from all of the work that's going on in your, in your region. Uh, my favorite um, food, I would say, are apricots. I'm eating some of them today, actually dehydrated and gleaned from um, uh, local apricot trees here in, in Tkemloops. Thank you, Michelle. I hope that hits all the, all the bullets. For sure, and thanks, thanks, and uh, I just, and just, uh, and thank you very much, the two of you for modeling how to go very quickly, because we have uh, 28 people on this call, and so if we can all just it, uh, take the minute, uh, then we'll get through it and, and get a sense of where we're all coming from, so I appreciate that. Carol, can you pick somebody to go next? Emily Mask, please. Hi there, my name is Emily Mask and I am the Organics Waste Coordinator for the City of Nelson, which is a new role and an expanding program that I'm working on. 
Um, I am really excited to participate in this workshop. I have seen lots of amazing policy work come out of this working group and I'm excited to be here and witness my favorite food right now is, hmm, I'm having bull trout for dinner. So let's say that. And I will pick Aiden. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. My name is Aiden McLaren Co. Um, I wear a few hats. Um, I'm a municipal councillor with the village of Nacusp. I also do some work with the Nacusp Area Development Board as the economic development coordinator. Um, I'm fairly new to the role and new to the Food Policy Council, but thus far I've been quite impressed with the uh, food security action plan, particularly the implementation plan. Um, and my, I love all kinds of food. I come from a food and beverage background, but if I had to pick one thing, um, I love a good shawarma, which is hard to find around here, but anyway, thanks. Sorry, I have to pick somebody. Um, I will pick uh, Nick. Hey everybody, my name's Mick. Um, I live in the unceded Sinex territory, which we call New Denver. Uh, and I'm a market gardener with my partner, Ruth. And I've had a market garden business in New Denver for the last 25 years. Um, I sit on the executive of the Food Policy Council for the last couple of years. Um, and uh, I think some of the things that I'm most proud of that we've done with the council is through Abra's leadership, which has been absolutely fantastic. And the amount of work she's put in has just been brilliant. Um, I'm fairly hands-on. I like to be able to see things, which has been quite hard for the last couple of years working on Zoom. Um, but I'm very proud of the food directory that uh, the council puts out. And um, I'm also looking forward to the new work that we're doing with ABRA and with the Food Policy Council in New Denver to create a food hub, um, which we are getting closer to doing and hopefully should be up and running by the end of next year. And I'm um, looking forward to working with ABRA and uh, the council on getting that running. Um, I think my favorite food is probably spinach, which at the minute is growing out in the garden under a cold frame and should be ready in March. So I'm already looking forward to that. Um, I think that kind of about covers it. I don't think of anything else, but uh, I just love what the council does. I've really missed the in-person meetings. I've missed the farm trips. And I'm hoping that once COVID is over, that we'll be able to get back to that. Because I think it's quite important that people actually sit in the same room together and have discussions. And it's been great to network and meet people from other farms and other walks of life. And the council's been really good for that. Um, and I think I would nominate, because I'm very pleased to see her and didn't realize she'd be on the call, Ashley Taylor. Hey, Ashley. Hi, Mick. <laughs> so my name's Ashley Taylor. Um, although actually it's Ashley Lorcher now. I just haven't got around to changing my name yet. I got married in September. Um, Mick was actually one of my mentors as I was a um, mentee for the Young Agrarians Business Mentorship Program. Um, I actually live in the East Kootenays, um, I would call myself a baby food policy advocate. I'm just trying to get into the field. Um, my business is uh, Valley Vitals. I run a small market garden, small scale poultry operation and composting program in both Fernie and the South Country area. Um, I'm very new to this area. Um, so I can't say there's anything specific that I can identify with the um, with the organization, but I'm just really happy to be part of these conversations. And my favorite food is pork belly. And I, I'm sorry, I've been kind of in and out for work. Um, so if I was going to select someone to go next, um, I would go with Ingrid if I didn't miss her speech before. All right. Um, hello. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Ingrid Liepa, and I'm uh, coming to you from Kimberley, living on the traditional unceded territories of the Tanaha peoples. And uh, um, oh gosh, for those who know me, I, I wear many, many different hats. But 
I'd say the hat I'm, I'm wearing here is um, on behalf of um, a, the food, small group of food stakeholders that are coming together in the Kimberley Cranbrook region in a, in a very preliminary way, but with, um, I think, you know, real aspirations to, to you know, move towards uh, becoming a food policy council of some sort or another. And so I'm here to learn and uh, I've followed the, the, the great work of the Policy Council for a few years now. And uh, yeah, just so impressive. I mean, clearly, I guess a, a provincial leader and, and, and likely also, you know, a leader on, on a much grander scale in terms of the, you know, the, the thinking and policy that's coming out and the, and the actions. The, um, I'll leave it at that. My favorite food oh sorry oh what's uh right uh achievements the food security action plan is amazing um yeah just kudos to everybody who was part of creating that and favorite food uh no question salmon and i will pass the torch over to valerie hi everyone um, so I, I just want to check everyone can hear me. Okay. Um, so I, uh, work for the Lardo Valley Lynx, which is a nonprofit society, uh, up in, uh, we're based out of Meadow Creek, but we cover the communities, um, at the North end of the Kootenai Lake. And, um, I've been with the Kootenai Food Policy Council, um, for a short time now, I believe I came on in the summertime. Um, so I've just been really impressed with what the Food uh, Policy Council has been able to continue to do during the uh, COVID time, being able to uh, keep up uh, with all of the amazing uh, programs that ABRA and the Council are, are putting forth. Um, and uh, I've been part of the uh, uh, the group working on the uh, anti-racism uh, work here with the Kootenai Food Policy Council, and I've been really interested in, in what that group is trying to achieve. Um, my uh, favorite food is, uh, is actually uh, apples. I'm really into apples at the moment, and um, I think I would uh, love to hear from um, perhaps... Uh, just through the list of names here. Maybe uh, Ramona uh, next. Whoops. Oh. Uh, thank you. And um, my name's Ramona Faust, and I'm the Regional District Director for Area E uh, in the Central Kootenai uh, Regional District, and that's Kootenai River, Kootenai Lake. Um, my pronouns are she, her. Uh, I'm in the um, unceded territory of the Silks, uh, Zaguatmec, Tanaka, and Sinaiks. Um, I My uh, passion for um, agriculture and food security um, has meant that I've been involved with the Food Policy Council since the very beginning. Um, with a varied background, and including cooperative farming and um, the co-generation of the Caslow Food Hub and, and some other things, as well as a large garden uh, myself. And um, I, uh, the thing that I'm most proud of is the fact that we managed to generate the Food Policy Council and see it um, see it it form uh, blossom and leave uh, the the arms of government and go out and be on its own and on top of that the meat regulation is something that was a um, a very uh, collaborative effort between uh, various regional district directors over time ABRA, the Food Policy Council, and uh, now people, I'm a vegetarian, but I'm happy that people can eat local meat. And my favorite food 
uh, unfortunately, I'm ashamed to say is, is not a local food, but it is avocado if I'm being truthful. And uh, I would um, pass it over to Annika or Anique. Yeah, you were right, it's Annika. Thank you, I thought um, so. I'm the grocery buyer at the Kootenai Co-op, and um, I uh, I think that I'm I'm pretty new to the council. My um, I don't so I, I don't have a lot of the history of the council, but I was really inspired by the relocalizing our food systems talk from the uh, the Basin Food Expo this year, and it was just so inspiring to feel like you know we're well in at the co-op anyway, we're doing our jobs. And it was really great to kind of have the, you know, think of the bigger picture and get really reinvigorated and excited again about the potential of what, what could happen in this region. Um, so that, uh, that I shared with the rest of our staff because it was, yeah, I was so excited about it. And uh, my favorite food is uh, refried beans because it goes with everything and always comes with good stuff. And next I would pick Nairi. Hi, I'm Nairi Marsh and I have a background in food production. I am currently affiliated with working for the Basin Business Advisor Program as the Agriculture Specialist. So I give free one-to-one -one advisement to agriculture businesses throughout the Columbia Basin. And I'm quite new to the council and quite new to the executive um, board. So I use the farm and food directory the most of all of our tools that have been created, um, but I can't claim a hand in that. And whew, favorite food is a hard one, but uh, I have to say my, my favorite vegetable is beets and uh, I will pass it along to Alice. Thanks, Mary. Um, hi everybody, long time no see. Um, my name is Alice Ford. I run Ravine Creek Farm um, in the heart of Snipes territory by the banks of the Slocan River. It's beautiful snowy, snowy morning. Um, uh, we've run Ravine Creek Farm for the last 10 years. I have been intermittently on this council and also wear a bunch of other hats with the Kootenai Organic Grower Society uh etc cetera, etc cetera. um and i think the thing that i am most proud of uh that the central kootenai food policy council has done in the last year has been watching um this evolution of the the dialogue and the conversation around um food security and food policy in our little backwater home here that has such a small population base um, uh, really just raised to this level like I want to say professionalism and the rigor of the work that the council is doing and the quality of the documents that uh, the council is producing it's just I feel like we have definitely really um, uh, just raised the raise the tenor of the conversation so I'm really proud of that I'm really proud of the level of professionalism and watching this council um, uh, really be continuing to grow. You know, all of this work that's been happening through 2020 and 2021 has just, it's been exponential. Um, uh, I haven't been as involved in the last year um, uh, as I would have liked to have been. So seeing all these new faces is amazing. Um, that's what I'm most proud of. My favorite food, I can't, I don't even, I, I couldn't even start as a farmer. <laughs> um, uh, my gateway food to getting into farming was tomatoes um and currently the thing that i love eating the most from our land here is salad it's just whatever whatever's in the salad bowl but lettuce i love lettuce <laughs> um and i would like to pass it to da, 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 da. amy no one heard from amy right Thanks, Alice. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Amy, and I'm the communications coordinator for the council. Um, one of the things I'm most proud of um, has been working with Abra. We've created a bunch of different infographics. One of them is the Relocalizing Food Action Grid, and we also did the Municipal Food Systems Table. And what excites me about them is taking 
ABRA's policy knowledge and knowledge of these complex systems and being able to bring in graphic design and information design and take these complex things and make them really accessible and shareable um, and digestible and actionable. So um, yeah, I've really enjoyed being able to create those resources as part of my work here. And my favorite food would be mushrooms. Um, I love foraging for them. And then I love frying them up in some butter and eating them. Uh, and I will pass it on to Paris. Thanks, Amy. That was a, um, that's a great visual is foraging the mushrooms and also eating them. Hi, my name is Paris Marshall-Smith. I um, work as sustainability planner for the RDCK. And I'm grateful and to be able to live and work on Sinaix, Silks, Shukwetmum, and Tanaha territory. And grateful to be in this session today as well. Um, my pronouns are she and they. And I think the I've been with the council not since 2016, but since 2017, and have really appreciated the evolution. And I would say there's probably a favorite thing of each year. And currently my favorite thing is the anti-racism work that's being done and how it's it's just it's I feel like we're approaching it in such a creative way and it's real as well and then and the discussions that are coming out of it are, are really challenging me and and I'm able to apply them into other areas of my life for which I'm grateful and my favorite food similarly I have lots and currently it's um, greens which so and kale would be at the top of that thank you Oh, and, and my apologies, I will pass it on to Shauna. Thanks, Paris. It's good to see everybody. I haven't been to the last couple of meetings, so I love seeing all your faces. Hello, um, I'm Shauna Fiddler, and I'm, I work with Kootenai Food, which is the West Kootenai Permaculture Co-op. I'm also uh, the producer of the um, Basin Food and Buyer Expo. <clears throat> I'm here on the banks of the Slocan River, um, unceded Semex territory. I'm about a 10 minute canoe from the pit houses. Really grateful for the land that I'm on here. Um, <laughs> I think the, the um, food directory is really something that I love. I love seeing, I love seeing the work that's gone into it. Um, I love seeing the new covers every year and I just love wandering around our community and seeing the food directories sitting astray and askew and on people's desks and in grocery stores that um, feels like a real accomplishment and a really, um, you know, tactile, um, tactile accomplishment of the Food Policy Council. Um, I wanted to just say, Michelle, it's so lovely to have you join us. I haven't been um, at a meeting that you've been here. So lovely. Welcome. It's, it's beautiful. Um, <clears throat> I think that my um, akpitsis, is that pronounced correctly, is also foraged mushrooms and kale. And if I could put them together on a piece of sourdough bread, I'm in heaven. <laughs> um, let's see, I'm going to call on somebody who hasn't spoken yet. Ari, hi, buddy. How about you go? Hi, Shauna. Thank you. Oh, it's so awesome to see everybody. I haven't been in a year and a half or so. Um, my name is Ari Durfel. I'm the general manager of the Kootenai Co-op in Nelson, uh, and I'm currently sitting in the traditional unceded territories of the Sinaiks, the Silics, the Tanaha, and the Sequemic. Um, in terms of what I appreciate, my gosh, I was at the first meeting, was that 2015, even before it formed ABRA, 2016, or like 2002, it feels like a decades ago. Um, and I'm going to appreciate the whole thing, uh, meaning like everyone that was there in those early years, we were doing the very unsexy work of governance and figuring out what the organization should look like and should we have a meeting calendar, like so much work was done, finding the garden, tilling the soil, just showing it uh, and, and, and trying to create ripe soil for all this amazing stuff. Um, to happen and some of the faces here like Elizabeth and Patrick and Paris and Ramona and folks that were there through all those early days of like what are we doing um, and then to step away a couple of years ago uh, and have you know you sometimes step away from an organization have a little fear like what's going to happen to the garden and to come back a year and a half late, later and see that it's exploded 
and that all of those seeds are like really growing into these beautiful things, having real impact uh, in the region is just so incredibly touching to see uh, and so satisfying. Uh, and the, the key through all of that has been Abra. When you look at the list of accomplishments for five years, 90% of those bullet points are Abra's being a mycelium and getting herself into every little aspect of the food system in the entire region just tirelessly. So I, I appreciate the arc of the entire experience and the amount of energy everyone has put forth and Abra's leadership through it all. So just thank, thanks to everybody. Uh, my favorite food is everything we sell at the Kootenai Co-op, but specifically what Annika buys. The 22,000 products she buys are my favorite. And I would say I'm comfort eating through the rainy season by getting the gluten-free pizza at Marzano. Uh, two or three of those a week is uh, keeping me happy right now. So great to see everybody. And I will, I will pass it to Abra because she's sitting next to me uh, on Zoom. Thanks, Ari. I was just responding to Michelle. Michelle, I think your list is accurate of those who haven't yet spoken. Um, I'm a little floored at the idea of being in mycelium. I'll have to think about that for a bit. Um, so I am the executive director of the Central Kootenai Food Policy Council. I'm based in Nelson, which is the territory of the Tanaha and the Sinaixt. And um, one thing I'm really proud about in terms of the Food Policy Council is the last year really stepping back from um, a colonial white supremacist approach to how we come together and really trying to find a different way of bringing us together um, that opens us up to new possibilities and new voices and creates more comfortable space for other people to join us. And so um, having just basically taking a hard look at what is always a very, very small budget and making space to hire Shana Jones to come and spend time with us um, at our annual general meeting was amazing. And then having the ability to, um, to provide an honorarium and sacred tobacco to um, Nisuk and Joe Pierre at our September meeting. And then also bringing Michelle in, I think has been a really important evolution in terms of breaking out of Robert's rules, which we never adhered to all that strictly, but still that coming together and here's our agenda and we will do this, this, and this. I'm really loving a more of a storytelling approach and just a reimagining of what we can be and how we make sure that we are truly inclusive. Um, so that's what I'm most proud of in the last year. And uh, my favorite food is a carrot, going back to growing up on a farm and my dad yanking one out of the soil and saying, here, eat it after he rubbed it, you know, wiped it off a bit on his pants. And uh, to this day, I love a carrot fresh out of the soil any time of the year. And I am going to ask um, Sadie to speak next. Hi, my name is Sadie. I use she, her pronouns and I work at the Kootenai Co-op. I've had a few roles over the years, but right now I'm office coordinator and I'm the board's administrative assistant. And I, um, the, the way I see the council most of the time is through Instagram and whoever's doing your Instagram work, you're doing a very good job. I really appreciate bringing very real messages into that unreal space. And my favorite food is the food that's in front of me. Um, right now, if I could manifest food in front of me, it would be a pomelo. Uh, Patrick. Thanks, Sadie. <clears throat> My name is Patrick Steiner. I'm, uh, I'm a food security coordinator here with the Caslow Food Hub, and that's in Caslow, of course, part of North Kootenai Lake Community Services. Um, there's so many things I'm proud of, of, of this council. Uh, one thing I like is just the way that we network and convene all kinds of great people involved in the food system in our area. So that, that might be my favorite thing at the moment. And it's even just looking at who's here today. It's just obvious that we really bring people together. Um, my favorite food is cooked greens, whatever, you know, spinach, chard, kale, mustards. I just love steaming them up and eating them. So that's, that's me. Oh, and I will send it on to Elizabeth Quinn. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Elizabeth Quinn, and I'm the executive director of Fields Forward in Creston. And we've just recently 
started a food hub here in, in Creston. It's very complex and we've got some of it operating, but we have a long way to go before we'll be operational, fully operational. And uh, my pronouns, I, I find it awkward, but you know, I have to learn new things. She, her, so that's, that's my pronouns. And then uh, what I'm proud of about the council, or I mean, there's so many things, but what I thought was amazing was when Abra launched the networking when the pandemic hit. I, I, I thought it took a lot of fortitude to just, when a lot of us didn't know what to do, Abra started this networking and we got to hear about what was happening all over the Kootenays, East and West Kootenays. And I found during a time of isolation that, that those networking sessions uh, brought a, a sense of connection. So like Patrick mentioned, the, the council and, and us meeting through Zoom, of course we preferred it when we could meet in person, but it brought a, some sense of belonging and, and connection in, a, in the whole Columbia Basin, which I thought was really great and still is. And my favorite food, I have, I live on two acres and we have fruit trees. And to me, it's like magic going out to my fruit trees and picking a plum or a cherry. And I feel like I'm in like some, it's a, I don't know, I, I'm transported to some other place and I eat that. And then the other thing is fresh greens in April. I mean, I cannot get enough of fresh green. So thank you. Oh, and the next person is Haley. Thanks, Elizabeth. I'll see if my camera, if my web doesn't freeze while I'm chatting. Hi, I'm Haley. I'm the uh, secretary of the Board of the Food Policy Council for the last few years. I'm on unceded to not and I to help territory between Nelson and Castlegar. Uh, in a very cold cabin. I'm moving out of in a few days. Um, I started farming this year, a market garden, mixed vegetables. Um, I also am the land matcher for the Young Agrarians and Events Coordinator, and I'm also the secretary of the board of the Kootenai Local Agricultural Society. So I come to these meetings um, wearing a few different hats. I'm very interested in what's going on uh, across the region and very proud of the work that the policy has done, uh, policy council has done over the last two years under Aber's leadership. Um, I would echo what Elizabeth has shared. I really enjoyed the pandemic roundtable discussions, um, just seeing every week how there were connections made in terms of um, sharing resources and knowledge and support across the region and in many different areas from uh, managing food banks and food cupboards to the, the food hub discussions and um, just lots of different amazing things came out of those meetings and um, as kind of an extension of, of getting together in these council meetings. So it's really awesome to see so many, so many faces here. Um, and my favorite things to grow and eat this summer, um, I had great success with cherry tomatoes and basil. Um, and uh, I love cilantro. I'll throw cilantro on anything and everything. Um, so uh, I think Farrell is the last one to go. Okay, I hope my video and audio hold out while, while I make this quick. Uh, so I live a, on an 11 acre forest lot uh, in Cinex, uh, traditional property in Rossburg, which is between Selma and Fruitvale. I have not had very much to do with the food council that I've been in this in the Kootenays for five years and have followed almost everything that I've followed from Abra, who uh, is remarkable in this regard. Um, I'm a councillor in the village of Selmo, um, and I certainly am focused on sustainable living um, in terms of what the Food Council is doing and, all, and keeping all the comforts that we are used to. Uh, basically, I participate in the Cannabis Economic Development Council, which ABRA established. And my, my sort of goal there is to try and take the stigma away and bring agriculture, uh, bring the cannabis and um, hemp industry back into agriculture again. 
basically my favorite food and i'll go along with all the mycelium and Sh shauna and amy i love uh, the lobster mushrooms that i pick on my through my in my forest here and that's my best food and now i'm going to have to hand it back to michelle All right. Well, <clears throat> uh, it's funny because uh, when Abra and Amy and I were talking about how we're going to organize this time, uh, and one of the one of the appropriately worded questions Abra had was, "What do we bring to the table?" And so I just think, man, if we all met and brought our favorite foods, what a feast! What a feast it would be, eh? Like, what a feast it would be. Um, and so thank you very much for that. And thank you for, for letting me know and, and letting each other know all of the different things that, that we can bring together. Uh, and I think that's what it's all about. And thank you for reminding me through this conversation about some of the work that you did in terms of bringing uh, different, different Indigenous folks to the table. Um, and I hope you recognize uh, the similarity, if you don't, but the similarity between what Joe shared with you in the Tanakha creation story, the emergent story of, you know, um, Nipika calling all living things, the Nasukan of all living things together, and then asked them, right, pose the question, the human beings are coming, what are you going to do about it? And so that's very much the, the methodology that I use in facilitation of bringing together the heads, right, the thinking, the roles, the responsibilities you have together, and then offering that, yeah, what do you want to do? Right? What are you going to do about it? What, what's your role and responsibility in, in the grand scheme of things? And so uh, I'm just going to share my screen again. Uh, and we'll get into these slides again. And I'm going to look over this way towards the camera. So some things to consider uh, that, uh, you know, when we're when we were discussing how we're going to use this time, which we are an hour in and we only have one hour left. And so hopefully uh, we'll be able to do this uh and and get you left my goal is not to give you the answer right okay my goal is not to give you the answer my goal is for you not to give me the answer okay it's a process right so i was just in oklahoma last week virtually um but just in oklahoma last week and i was like the process is the product the process is the product. And it's a bit different for people to get their heads around that, but that is actually what we're in. You're in a process. And so we're in it. So we're just gonna cover these five really quickly, um, these five ideas, these five things to consider uh, that we're in a moment of great change, uh, whether we recognize that or not. How many of us recognize we're in a moment? We're in actually a moment of many great changes. Uh, talking to my 90 plus year old adoptive mother, uh, she, when I told her about my son and his education issue with COVID, she immediately went back to the Second World War as a, as a grade 11 student uh, and what happened to her education. And so I was like, oh yeah, right, of course, right? So uh, we've been here before, right? But on top of that, we're also in a moment of reconciliation uh, and an acknowledgement of intractable conflict. And so I wonder how many of you know the history of agriculture in the Kootenays, Tanakha, Aksmaknik, Sanaiks, and, and the shared territory with Silks as well. How many of you know the history of agriculture uh, going back to the 1800s, going back to the designation of the reserves and why there are no reserves in that area related to agriculture? Sort of, somewhat, yeah, there's a long history. How many of you know the history of agriculture, food and residential schools? Right, how many of you know the Canada Food Guide was actually a product of the research done in the residential schools in nutrition with indigenous children? Right, so these are some of the things uh, that we need to consider when we actually think about reconciliation, which brings us to the next, the acronym of JEDI. I've got a great paper if you're interested on why that's problematic. 
uh, and it is problematic uh, for a lot of Indigenous people, myself included. And Jedi, if you're not familiar, refers to justice, sometimes equity, sometimes equality, depending on who you're talking to, diversity and inclusion. Uh, it's also called the DJ, right? Diversity, equity, uh, equality, uh, justice and inclusion. And then you get the DEEI, right? Which is diversity, equity, inclusion or diversity, equality, inclusion, et cetera, et cetera. But it's all basically has the same foundation of inclusion, which implies we just have to get in, right? It has to be, it's an assimilative model that everything is set the way that it's supposed to be and we're just gotta get fit in. Uh, and so I'm, I'm highly critical um, of these models for a whole bunch of different reasons, including the fact that my favorite food um, is actually uh, not domesticated. I never want it to be domesticated. Um, and a number of my foods and a number of um, the principles behind something like this. I don't know how many of you know this book. Anybody? No, this is written by a Canadian. And they talk about epigenetics and they talk about biological embedding, which are two favorite things of mine. And, uh, and the fact that, you know, when I look at my children and the fact that I reintroduce them to a place-based diet, I'm a firm believer in a hundred kilometer or hundred mile diet, uh, but my hundred miles probably looks different to your hundred miles. Uh, and that's not to say they can't coexist, uh, but there are some things for us to think about. So as we approach these ideas, um, I use Michael Yellowbird, Dr. Michael Yellowbird, who is a social work professor over at the University of Manitoba and a, and a colleague and a good friend and a mentor of mine. And he talks about the five criticals being critical consciousness, right? So first piece is actually making, uh, making the time, space and place to actually become uh, conscious or woke. Um, the next one is perspective. To, so understanding our perspective and where we're coming from, what our understandings are may be different. Thus the creation story, right? And ena enabling, right? Klausla, grizzly bear does not have to be in Suk, mouse. Those are my favorites, right? Mouse is my favorite. And coyote and so on and so forth. None of them all have to be the same. And if you look at, right, what is biodiversity? What is the climate change issue is the fact that we are trying to unify biodiverse areas, places, experiences. And if we can start to recognize the biodiversity of peoples, which I know is like, what? Um, but the fact that we all have different experiences and different places. And the way you can even look at this is, and I tell people this all the time, if you eat an elk, from the Elk Valley or from Invermere or from uh, Slocan, right? It all tastes different. Why? Because the ground, the minerals, all living things, Akamas Guppy Cupsin, the biology of that place of the food they're eating is slightly different. And that's some of the stuff that's missing for indigenous peoples in our diets. Our health issues are related to that. And so also thinking about, so that's critical perspective, right? So critical consciousness, critical perspective, then the critical reflection. So taking time to pull back and think about, okay, what's really important? What is driving our conversation? What is our need? How do we meet those needs? So exactly, right, that idea of during the pandemic and isolation, you start to network because that's an important thing for you to do. Right. So taking the step back and thinking about, OK, Zoom isn't the best way of doing these things, but the intention, the heart is still there. Uh, so that's critical consciousness, critical perspective, critical reflection, and then the critical thinking. Right. How do we put this stuff together? And then the critical doing. So the actions, right, all of those different actions, which many of you actually uh, expressed. And then the conversation about these food systems, food sheds food sovereignty and food security. And those are all very context specific um, in my understanding and how I've been sort of thinking about this 
uh, after a conversation with Amy and Abra and then looking at your reports and then thinking about just in my life, right, and just in the, in the places that I sit in. So I do a lot of research with the Columbia River Treaty, with uh, diet study, so health quality, um, sorry, water quality and human health risk assessments. Uh, and biodiversity and biodiverse inventories, food inventories. Uh, let me just look here. Okay, sorry, somebody's just going. Uh, so involved in a change process. Uh, when the when the chat comes up, I do check it, <laughs> just so you know. Uh, so understanding change processes. How many of you have seen something like this? Some uh, an equation like this. Uh, anybody? So when you're thinking about vision, um, there, it's attached to a whole bunch of different things, right? Because vision in, implies a change. And you can look back at your last five years and look at when you started in 2015, right? And how you've actually evolved to this point. And so some of you have pointed out that you had skills, you had ABRA, you had incentives, right? Your different organizations figured out how to bring these things together. You had resources and then you had action and you created that change. And so as we move forward, we need to start thinking about these pieces. And, and um, I really appreciate the acknowledgement um, of Abra because one of the things that Abra said to me in when we were doing this, because I was like, okay, are you participating or are you leading this? And she said, no, I'm going to participate. And I was like, great. Because often what happens when we have really great leadership is we don't actually think about who's coming behind, right? Who's coming up with her? Who's going to take it the next step, right? How do we support? We create that, we recreate that hierarchy. And then what happens when that person at the very top, right? They're doing so much and trying to do so much and it's their life work and it's beautiful work, but we, we need to actually move that up, right? That's a self-actualization model that's based on Blackfoot. Um, ideologies and, and philosophy. So many know the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? But he actually ripped it off the Blackfoot and it actually goes like this. And so that moment the Western system starts is, is right here because the Blackfoot goes like this, right? So that's what, so as you guys were talking, I was like, oh yeah, you know, there's some, there's some key pieces here already I can see. Um, to think about. And so we don't want something missing. We want to think about the big picture. We want to think about all the different pieces and put those together. And I think you have those um, for the most part. Sorry, my clicker isn't working. Uh, so this is what's called a decolonizing framework. So this is something that's very, very often um, shared, you know, in the Jedi, in the anti-racism and all of these different places. Excuse me, how many of you have seen something like this? Yeah, okay. How many of you are like, yeah, this is a good idea. And I know I'm, I'm kind of setting you up, but because um, I think what we're taught is that, yeah, this is a good thing. This is, a, this is, this is the way to go. And I've been taught that as well, um, just so you know, right? Because I was like, yeah, I think this, this works out. And uh, disproportionate universality, you know, things like this. And, and I'm like, yeah, okay, I, I think I get it. And I think that's a good idea. Um, the problem with this system, of course, is that idea of inclusion, right? That there's already a system in place and we just have to include everybody, which comes as a, a, a very disconscious form of racism and becomes a system of assimilation. And so this last piece, right, the goal is liberation. And I use the example of being Tunacha. Uh, my great, great, great grandfather was Isidor. Uh, he was the last Tunacha. Uh, he was the first Tunacha to be leader to be put on reserve. Of course, Sam Steele, right? You all heard of Sam Steele. He came in to uh, quell the Tunacha uprising. Uh, and he was the contemporary to my great grandfather, my great great grandfather, who usurped his social responsibilities for my people. Uh, and every year we have a parade to celebrate Sam Steele. So where there might have been barriers to me being able to go to that parade over years, there are no more barriers, but the parade continues. So I'm supposed to be happy to go and watch it. And I'm here to say, I don't actually want to watch that parade. Uh, I want to celebrate with people, but maybe we can figure out something else to celebrate, right? And so it's that thinking about, you know, is liberation truly liberation for everyone? 
or does it feel good and we think it is? So having to, to apply those criticals, those five criticals can help us think through better how to do this kind of work in a way that is actually going to empower each other, right? And build those really good relationships. If you've been in other work with me, you know that I quite often talk about how Indigenous people and Canadians in general are in a really poorly arranged marriage that isn't working. And so we need to actually figure ourselves out, right? Take some time, take some breaks, right? And figure some stuff out about each other and then come back. Because if we keep coming back through these issues, right? And we never actually resolve things. We just expect things to be different and they're not. And they're not going to be that different until we actually do differently in the first place, right? Until we start to think differently. And so some assumptions about reconciliation, and we're all familiar with reconciliation, I'm sure. We have been in the summer of light and heat, right? And now in the water, right, coming forward. Uh, and we're dealing with a lot of these um, experiences, which for a lot of Indigenous people, we're not surprised by. Uh, and we have been saying for a very long time, there is developmental trauma so people talk about climate change in my language, I call it developmental trauma. And for me, I look at the development upon landscapes and waterways that have altered and just like a human being suffering, right? Our, our natural landscapes are also suffering and they're dealing with those developmental traumas over time. And so someone was telling me about water the other day and without trees, we can't keep the water. And I'm like, yep, I got it. I remember. Uh, and uh, thinking about, you know, there was a guy, young guy walking across Canada because he's rewilding. He wants to rewild Scotland. Uh, how many of you have ever, did you guys hear about him? Yeah. So he walked across Canada because uh, to raise money because he recognized the colonial legacy with Canada, with Scotland, and the fact that the Scottish immigrants came to Canada because they were being displaced off their lands and then it was deforested for farming, for agriculture, for the industrial, right, industrial revolution, et cetera, et cetera, came over here and now they have no wild animals and they have you know, field deer and, and um, meadow deer, right? So farmed deer and wild deer, and they put those on the menu. And if you, I don't know if any of you have been to Scotland, but they've got really, really good food. Uh, so understanding, right, some of our assumptions, do we understand what reconciliation is? And the big one for me always is, do we recognize that reconciliation implies a conflict, right? Do we ever do reconciliation work or any sort of reconciliation in relationships if we don't acknowledge, like we don't go up to somebody and say we're sorry if we don't understand that something is we need to apologize for something we need to acknowledge something and so it means we have to accept that something needs to change along the way uh, and that we're mostly unprepared for that we don't get that in our formal schooling we don't get that in our formal education uh, quite often this sort of understanding this sort of training is sort of we don't have time for that we just need to get the work done right uh, that's like soft skills. We don't really need that. Uh, we need to get this done, right? We need to get this done. Uh, but understanding that actually in order to get this work done, we actually need to include these pieces. We need to understand. Otherwise, we end up continuing. An example of that, if you look at the residential school system, the residential schools were uh, shut down and then child welfare ramped up as the next solution, which removed Indigenous children full stock in some communities, myself included, that we're now coming back, right? Does that make sense? So we're still, we're actually perpetuating problems uh, without, without thinking about what the systemic problems are. And so for me, I look at it in terms of intractable conflict. So some of you, if you look at my um, uh, uh, website, um, I go to the Center for Resolution of Intractable Conflict at Oxford every year, and I'm working with Dr. Daniel Bartel, who literally wrote the book about intractable conflict in the Middle East. And uh, what I recognize is that intractable conflict here in my homelands 
in the shared territories. Uh, and they are called shared territories because of the treaty process. And that these um, distinctions between ownership or stewardship uh, are really coming and stemming from that more recent conversation around having to put a line on a map rather than the actual agreement that the three nations had amongst ourselves. And so um, this is, I don't expect you all to remember this, but maybe you'll, you'll Google that, maybe you'll find my paper, um, but really understanding that intractable conflicts have all of these characteristics. And so a lot of these characteristics are in policy. Uh, and so when you think about farming, for example, and you think about um, the relationship of uh, reserves to livelihood. And so this is a great book, another great book, right? By Cole Harris. Um, another great book, maybe you haven't heard of, or maybe you have, is a book by Hugh Shul. I don't have it here because it's up at the college in my other office. Hugh Shul, Enough to Keep Them Alive, in which, have you heard of that book that's specific to BC? And it's specific to understanding how food was used as a weapon uh, for Indigenous peoples and transforming our diets. Uh, and uh, yeah, because we couldn't be outright starved, uh, but, or, you know, dying, but we could be starved uh, to a limit. So there's a lot of pieces to figure out. Uh, the good part is, is that Indigenous people, we've been working on this kind of work, while this decolonizing framework has been going on, we've actually as Indigenous people collectively and as individual nations and peoplehoods been working very hard on what is at issue? What do we need to, to understand and appreciate better? So we have the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with that. Um, and if you've done any sort of search in there around foods and food sovereignty, uh, and food security and um, the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you have looked through that entire document uh, and understood better, you know, what does this mean in terms of access to food and food sovereignty? And then things like the Truth and Reconciliation Calls to Action, in which food is implicated. Um, people don't necessarily always see it that way, right, because it's specific. But when you go into the reports and you start to search the reports for these terms, it comes up, right? It, it definitely comes up. And of course, the murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls um, inquiry and the reclaiming power in place. Uh, and they've done a lot of work in terms of decolonization, right? What is decolonization? What does it look like? And so, uh, and then finally, we are at a time now of the BC Declaration Act. How many of you are familiar with that one? I'm gonna ask you this again, yeah, okay. Uh, and how many of you have thought about it in terms of the food sovereignty, right? The, this, this food security, right? Food policy uh, and the BC Declaration Act, yeah, okay. Uh, so there, yeah, so these are some of the things that, you know, I think we, right? When you're talking about the anti-racism, these are some of the implications of thinking deeply about what does it mean to be anti-racism and racist in terms of food. Um, the number of people, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, and myself included, who are having food allergies, um, even to organic and, you know, all of the good foods we're supposed to be eating uh, and can't even eat anymore. Um, and so going back to traditional diets, going back to traditional remedies. I had the benefit of getting a report given to me uh, just a few weeks ago on uh, Tanakha Ethnobotany that was written. The research was done in 1973. Nobody has seen this report because it left our community with the researchers and that one of those researchers gave it to me. And I was reading from people I hadn't even met because of course at that point I was like five years old and I wasn't there because I was adopted out. And so reading some of these knowledge holders who were at that point in their 70s and 80s and telling me about what, and so they were recounting what their grandparents had told them about the plant systems and what we did with them and how we prepared them and so on and so forth. So in 2021, getting this report 
and being able to look at this and going, wow. And then looking and finding, oh, I need to try that. Oh, I need to eat this. Oh, I need to go back, right? And then looking at my own son, who's 18, who has already been foraging in the forest all on his own, like didn't even know, right? But coming back and saying, I'm eating these things and then learning from knowledge holders that actually this is why we would eat that. So something for us to think about. Uh, so we're at the check-in here. I'm going to uh, copy this into the chat unless um, Amy or if somebody who's, no, never mind. This is the next round. Um, and this was a very, very quick, like honestly half an hour of uh, just giving you some ideas, some of the things for you to think about. And so um, asking you now, what content from this, what I just shared, uh, sticks with you or makes you have an aha moment? What seems relevant to how you're thinking about moving forward in the next five years, right? Uh, and what feelings, right? Hopes and challenges, that's the one set of questions. And then the next ones um, are, uh, actually we can do that next. And we'll do it sort of a pop-up instead. So, so given that we have 40 minutes uh, and we have still, how many people do we have? 21, nope, I can't count today. 19, 19 people. Uh, anybody want to start? And you don't have to, if you, if you want to pass, you can go ahead and pass. Oh, somebody found my paper. There you go. Thank you, Sadie. Uh, <laughs> um, if, uh, who wants to, who wants to start with this one? So it's, I'll put it into the chat. So what seems relevant to your next piece of work? Um, what feelings? Uh, go ahead, Ramona. Sorry, there, there was silence. And I always, as a politician, like to not be the first person to speak. Um, but um, what seemed very relevant to me was the, the diagram uh, about inclusion because we all adopt that language. Um, as a person of slight color myself, uh, I adopt that language. And so now I'm going to deconstruct that for a very long time. So thank you for that. Thanks, Ramona. Anybody else? I'm just, I'm not gonna uh, like, we're, we're not gonna make everybody talk this time. Uh, and I'm perfectly comfortable with silence. <laughs> um, I, thank you. I would like to add to that as well. And um, I work with Ramona, and so I appreciate the yeah, that um, I also adopt that language and, and we're trying to develop it, um, some response or some work at the RDCK. And so I'm grateful for that clarity too. And yeah, it's I, 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 it, that was an aha moment of right assimilation. Um, the, the invitation into a dominant paradigm and um, or whatever, not even invitation, but the and the other piece is that um, given that the Food Policies Council's skills, great skills um, of infographics and, and education, I wonder about translating some of that, inf that that storytelling that you were talking about in terms of agricultural land and residential schools and the um, the um, pyramid, the food pyramid, and starting to illustrate that, that would be, um, yeah, really poignant and uh, an, a, an effective education tool, I think, for us. What is the history of agriculture and, um, and colonization in the Kootenays? And thank you, Michelle. Thanks, Ramona and Paris for sharing. Um, I have so much to say on this that I actually am like nervous about getting started. Um, conscious of, of the amount of time that we have here and the space 
um, uh, moment. Oh, as a as an agriculturalist, as a farmer, somebody who has dedicated um, you know most of my adult life to um, this process of finding ways to nourish myself and my community from this very specific land that I'm on and this very specific land that occurs, that arises in this very specific context of this valley that I live in and the you know, millennia of history of this place. And then, you know, the more recent um, uh, waves of history, the story of this land. <sighs> Those are like really deep, you know, I, I, I feel, you know, an affinity with phil philosopher farmers that is, you know, like I, I got into this not just for a job, it was also an answer to existential questions that I had about the world um, uh, and my place in it and how to engage in healing for myself and for what I perceived as being the injuries of the world or the ills of the world. Um, I was reminded, I loved um, Michelle, I wrote it down, developmental trauma and the trauma that the landscape sustains through development. I love that. I'm going to be riffing on that for days, I'm sure. Thank you for that. I was reminded um, as you were speaking of maybe one of the last um, uh, times that I was with the Food Policy Council with the subgroup that was working on the infographic and um, it was right at the beginning of that project and we were talking about what food crop to choose. Um, and we, we, met, we, we, we bounced the idea of salmon. You know, salmon was the very first thing that came up as, you know, like could salmon be this, you know, um, uh, this food crop that, we, that or not, not a crop, but this food that we could talk about is very place based for us here. Um, and, we chose not to go forward with salmon because it seemed like it needed more depth and respect and just a better, we, we felt like we, I think, you know, we felt like we weren't really going to do justice to all of the many different facets of salmon in this one project. And so we set it to the side. Um, but also one of the things that came up uh, was Abra, you asked me, you know, well, you know, and how about, you know, like we're, we're trying to, you know, um, speak to farmers and to agriculture here. And, you know, what, you know, is there maybe, it wasn't a question, you weren't, you know, making a statement, you were asking a question of like, you know, is there something, you know, would farmers perhaps feel like, you know, if we chose this wild food, does that feel like, you know, farmers aren't getting represented? And I believe, I fervently hope that we are coming to a place collectively and individually where we cannot continue to see any piece of this puzzle as in isolation. And that was my response at the time. I was like, you know, salmon is, you know, is incredible there. You know, like we, we live and farm on this interconnected landscape. It's not siloed over here is a farm and over here is salmon and over here are schools. And we are, whether we acknowledge it or not in this deeply interconnected web of life. And I fervently hope that we are getting to a point where more and more people are not able to deny those interconnections. Um, so that's what was coming up for me listening to this. I have a great hopefulness that we are in this watershed moment, um, you know, once again, where we can't deny that the forests are connected to the fields are connected to the rivers and which is all connected to the deep history of the places that we inhabit. I'm gonna pause there. Those are the thoughts that I could go on forever. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, Patrick. Can, oh. oh, sorry. Patrick and then Elizabeth. Okay, I'll go, I'll go first. I'll be, I'll be brief. Um, lots there in what you said, Michelle, was, was new for me and I've written down all kinds of terms for me to follow up on that will be very engaging. Um, intractable conflict was one of the ones that was really re relevant for me. Um, obviously with sort of the history of, of settler and, and indigenous peoples, that, that lens, but it also made me think a lot about our current food system and the intractable conflict that exists uh, with you know local people trying to create 
a more localized, a more uh, sustainable food system and, and how that is right in conflict with the kind of global food system that we have. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the other really big term uh, phrase that stuck with me and that's so relevant to our Food Policy Council was when you mentioned uh, the process is the product. And that is, I think, so important to the way that we do things here because, uh, I mean, when we did look at that timeline earlier on, we started and there were so many outputs there that were accomplishments of the Food Policy Council and, and, and that seemed so impressive. But what I know as a member of the council is that to get to those outputs and not even considering the outputs is just all of these meetings that we have, the process of sharing information, inspiring each other, constant learning that goes on in the council, being part of it. That's as, as useful to us as members as the final products is to the output is to, to, to other people who see it. So the process is the product was very important to me as well. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Elizabeth? My ideas are not very well formulated, but maybe as I speak, they'll become more formulated. It's more just uh, kind of I'm in, in shock, actually, over a lot of what you presented was so new. Like my, my brain is and my body are kind of re kind of going wow like a whole, whole new way of seeing life which I find extremely refreshing and also it's a bit shattering at the same time and then uh but what I thought was most interesting and a couple of people mentioned it already is the the inclusion assumes that the current paradigm is to be to it welcome people into the current paradigm that we know has not been working. So that's a great new lens to see. Yeah, we don't wanna invite people into a, an existing paradigm that is, has not really served us and humanity or even the people of even the Kootenai say. And then the other thing is the idea of conflict. So acknowledging that the conflict exists and I, something about that is fascinating and, and I, but I need more help, Michelle, with understanding some of the things. I mean, it goes without saying, I need a lot of help with a lot of what you presented. So I would like to propose if we, you know, for the next year, like taking some of these ideas and, and applying them and becoming more educated in uh, some of these concepts that you presented. So thank you. I, I just thought it was awesome. Anybody else? Oh, yeah, we have a cat. Oh, OK. <laughs> Normally, I have a cat. <laughs> OK, anybody else? Haley, your, your uh, mic is on. Yeah, I just wanted to also reiterate that interest in, you know, diving deeper into the different concepts that you've started to explore with us today. Um, I, for example, did had no idea about the col colonial roots of the Canada Food Guide. And I, though it shouldn't have surprised me, I had never, I didn't know that. And that's just one example of something that's very um, kind of ingrained in this, just a, a lot of assumptions um, that we can make in, uh, about the history of, of these very, um, ingrained structures um, and processes in our in our lives. And so that would be one example that that I think would be interesting to explore further. Thanks, Haley. Anybody else? Hey, Michelle, this is Mick. Hi, Mick. Uh, hey, I, that was awesome talk. Um, I took so many things from that inclusion equals assimilation. It's something that I hadn't really thought of before, but it's absolutely right. Um, and to try and put that towards the Food Policy Council, I actually don't, even though I've farmed here for 30 years, I probably don't know a lot of the history of farming or Indigenous farming pre-colonialization in the Kootenai area, and I, I would love to know more. I don't know if that's an area we could look into. Um, and also, um, 
think with the inclusion assimilation colonialization i'm almost we did talk about this a month or two ago about where there are name change possibility for the kootenai policy council and whether the central kootenai policy council is actually an appropriate name for the way we may want to go forward in the future and uh, maybe we should look at something that is more relevant to the way we might want to move forward um, just thoughts that came to my mind Anybody else? And we don't have to. These are great already. Um, and so this, yeah, we weren't expecting, uh, I wasn't expecting, I don't think Abra and Amy, we were expecting to get to a definitive, here's what we're gonna do next. Uh, this was to really bring us together and, and have a conversation and sort of look from a different lens uh, that whole idea of looking from another lens and what would this look like? Um, and so uh, I'll just have a minute of a moment of silence to see if anybody else wants to uh, make a comment. So I look over everybody and then we'll go to the last slide because we have about 20 minutes left. Okay. So this last slide is really about uh, the next steps, right? So thinking about, you've just had two hours, right? Literally two hours, regrouping, reconnecting with everybody, thinking about something very, very big. So just know it's very, very big, uh, what I've just presented to you. Uh, and on purpose to help think about what does your next five years look like. And for me, um, because we're such a human centric society, uh, the weird society, right? Western, industrial, educated, rich and democratic values is what guides us. Uh, and that's coming out of UBC psychology uh, that we are very, very human centric. And myself as a Tanakha, a Ksmaknik, I am actually more so cosmic centric. When we talk about all living things, that's how I'm trying to live my life, right? So understanding what these different systems mean and how they connect, right? How do we do this? Um, I appreciate the comments on the paradigms, right? Because that's always been my question to people. Why would you want us to assimilate to a paradigm that doesn't work for the people who built that paradigm? The social issues we have are not stemming from us as Indigenous people. The social issues we have are because we're Indigenous people in a paradigm that doesn't accept that we're Indigenous people, right? And that our worldviews are very different. And so, um, and why I'm saying that is, is recognizing that at the very beginning when I said, you know, I know your hearts are good, right? But really knowing that what you're, suggesting to embark on will take some time to get your hearts and your minds together, right? To ground both of those, um, to be able to be uh, able to be enabled, to be empowered, right? To find the power within yourselves to do differently, right? To make comments, to challenge ideas and each other and self. And that's a really big part of that growth process, right? That socialization we have as as Nacha that I've been through um, in ceremony, and we have lots of those social systems to do that in. Uh, and I don't know how many of those social systems exist within that weird paradigm. I don't see it. And so that's a lot of the teaching that I do is trying to support people. And especially nowadays we hear, right? People are asking for indigenous people's knowledges to include indigenous people's knowledges and recognizing that that's not just the paradigm of traditional ecological knowledge, like going back, it's actually how are we living with all these traumas today? Historical trauma, intergenerational trauma, developmental trauma, acute trauma, ambiguous loss, right? All of these systems that we're all actually dealing with. Um, so in the next, 20 minutes. Uh, sorry, I see somebody has a chat in there. Um, 
Ah, well, you'll get the recording, right? Because we've got a recording happening. So you'll all have the recording, even if you miss it today. So don't worry, right? We'll, we'll keep moving. Uh, so what do you know or think you know? And I don't mean that in a shaking finger kind of way. I mean that in the ability to respond. So I often tell people, right? When you think of, you know, be responsible, you usually get this, right? How many of you have gotten this? Curled eyebrows, you're not being responsible. Come on, you know you have, right? Or you've done it, you are not being responsible. I like to think of it more as the ability to respond, right? Something's coming to us and we have the ability to respond to whatever that is. And so again, using the example, right? Abra of the networking through the COVID pandemic, right? That is the ability to respond. Having clear intention of what's the most important to your work regardless of the technology, right? And bringing that forward. So that's how I main it around what you think you might know. So what do you know about the BC Declaration Act? Uh, what are the topics you are now thinking about as relevant to vision for the next, uh, and for the next five years? And is that different than where you started from today? Did you come in with an idea of this is what I think we should talk about uh, for the next five years? And did that shift over this last couple of hours? Um, and yes or no. And again, whoever wants to speak, uh, please do. If you want to add it into the chat, that works as well. Uh, but this is your living document. So you know how people say, right, they're living documents. This is a living process, right? So having the recordings is not just for me, but it's actually for you to go back over and maybe watch with some other people or maybe share with some of the people you're working with so that they can begin to understand Okay, what are we talking about, right? What's that essence here? So, and I love that Ramona said that she wasn't comfortable with silence because I'm all about it. I'm like, insert silence here. So anybody, as you're thinking through, I'm going to put these notes into the chat. How many of you have heard of the BC Declaration Act? Let's start there. Two, three people. Okay, so is maybe this, that's- it, Is that the BC adopting the United Nations Declaration? Is that is that what that is? As the framework for reconciliation, yes. Okay, I just didn't know it by that name, I think. Oh, what name do you know it by? Oh, I don't know if you're speaking because you got a mask on. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, no, that's fine. I just didn't, I just wanted to know that that's what it was. Oh, okay. Because I think that's an important point too, right? Is that as things roll out, people uh, uh, like put different names to things, right? And so I think that's a big part of it. When we're talking about the declaration, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, for example, lots of people call it UNDRIP. And I'm going to tell you right now, I had my hand slapped by somebody who was actually a writer of that policy and slapped my hand for two reasons. One is it's the only UN document, international law document, completely written by, for, and with Indigenous peoples, number one. And number two, it's the first time since uh, the 1100s and the papal bulls of the 1100s that indigenous people have actually been recognized as people. So in your talks, when you're talking about the UNDRIP, if you would do me and other indigenous peoples a favor and actually call it what it is, the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, because in doing so, and if we really believe in Akama Skepi Gepsa and all living things, you are actually giving energy to Indigenous peoples by naming us, 
as peoples, right? Because that actually, those papal bulls are what actually enabled the genocides that we've been suffering over time. Early free informed in consent, early free and informed consent over decisions in their territory. So Ramon has added that. Uh, yes, and that whole idea of free prior informed consent is actually uh, the first article that came out of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples because Peru as a nation state didn't wanna send their indigenous peoples to the table to write. And so nobody went to the table. And so what, and that was where that came from, that free prior and informed consent, not about us, not without us, right? And we have to be at the table. We are, we are indigenous led, this is from us. Now the challenge with free prior and informed consent is most people take that as an ethics and usually removed into consultation, right? And usually removed into some other entity and only in this frame. When in fact, free prior and informed consent is actually the right to our self-determination, our self-development, right? And our, our, our um, uh, every right we have, right? How we express, how we live our lives, uh, all the way from our languages and cultures, right? To our actual decisions around, um, you know, like you say, the territory, but it's also impacts culture, impacts uh, spirituality impacts our every day, right? That we actually have uh, the information and the knowledge and can make our own decisions of how we want to live our lives, where we want to live our lives, with whom we want to live our lives. So thanks for that, Ramona. Um, anybody else? So I've just put into the chat what the questions are. And then maybe, yeah, Elizabeth, go for it. I, I just think that Abra has, has had the majority of the ideas of what has formed the Central Kuni Food Policy Council. So I would be interested in hearing Abra because she has been our leader, our fearless leader uh, with so much experience. And I, I uh, value Abra's experience and ideas. And, and uh, so Abra, do you have a few thoughts? Um, well, if it's, I have a lot of thoughts. Um, in this realm in particular, uh, I could go on at great length. I could appreciate, Alice, your, your challenge around as an agriculturalist and recognizing that agriculture has long been an incredibly effective tool of genocide across the places we call the Regional District of Central Kootenai, British Columbia, Canada. I remember Don Morrison challenging me about that 20 plus years ago. And as someone who grew up in the farm and I, on a farm and I spent my entire life deep engaged with farmers and food systems of the colonial state, uh, I had a really hard time with that. It took me years to get past um, the resistance to that truth. Um, and I find I, I turned 60 this year. I'm, I'm going to have a grandchild in May, and I, I'm just at this time in life where I'm really trying to figure out what's mine to do. And I, I, um, I find it ironic that after a lifetime of activism and fighting to be able to make a living and keep this Food Policy Council going, um, I have a certain level of expertise in policy in a colonial structure that I don't find has any um, integrity, authenticity, um, truth, there's so much wrong with all the policy landscapes within which I work. And I find it ironic that, you know, I no longer have to try and justify, well, I don't have academic expertise for what I do, because I have a lifetime of experience that guides my work. But it's work within a colonial structure, I find profoundly offensive. And, um, and I'm, I'm sorry, it's really hard for me not to get emotional about this. 
when I think about what's going on right now in Wet'suwet'en territory, and I think about this Declaration Act and the complete lack of integrity of our political leaders provincially, to say, no, you cannot go there and arrest people who have every right, if you want to use the language of rights, it is their responsibility to protect that territory. It's given to them since time immemorial. And we as a Canadian state, British Columbians, we are tacitly endorsing the, the jailing of people who have the obligation to protect that land. And in the media, it's spun as all those elected councils support the, the gas link project. And I just, I am so infuriated that we as Canadians are so incredibly ignorant of the history and ongoing practices of genocide and colonialism that we don't even recognize why that's a bad thing for the press to keep spinning. You know, like those elected people who are part of this colonial structure say this is fine, but the people with the real obligation to that land space, land to that landscape, those waters, their culture, their history have said no. And we are not doing enough to stop it. And like sometimes I just want to go up there and join because it's so wrong. And the fact that there's no salmon here anymore is so wrong. There's, there's, it, I, I don't even know where to start sometimes. And I, that intractable conflict, I feel like I've been living it in my work for probably about 15 years now. It's like I have one leg strongly, like reading, where's my book? I don't have it. If you read Lee Miracle's Conversations with Canadians, like, mm -hmm. holy shit, talk about blowing your brain and your perceptions out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, don't take my politeness as an acceptance of all of that that is wrong with what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And so I'm torn at this point in the Food Policy Council's history of we get the little bit of core funding we get is from the regional district of central Kootenai. That's the colonial structure. All the rest of it, I'm constantly trying to dream up some project to keep us going. Mm -hmm. And yet that's not where my heart is and where my belief systems are around how we need to revisit everything about how we are on this landscape from fee simple to where we get our food, how we get our food, what we prioritize in terms of um, what we understand as an economy, the importance of ecosystems, trees, the developmental trauma. I love that language. It's absolutely right. I've hated the language of development for a long time because it's it's about destruction and yet we call yeah. it development. So I'm sorry, Elizabeth, you uh, popped up. Don't, don't be sorry. Uh, don't be sorry. Before Elizabeth, before you go though, there was a comment in the uh, chat that I wanted to acknowledge that holding the priority to identify and support indigenous led initiatives on food sovereignty. Mm -hmm. uh, and then with Farrell uh, says, I fully agree with Aber that our legal, our, our legacy political system is broken and needs to be reinvented to overcome real issues. Elizabeth. I, uh, I was, I can see how, why we're all confused or I shouldn't say all of us, but I am and not knowing how to move forward. And I can see Aubrey, you've been doing a lot of thinking and now it's like uh, shaking up a lot of the way you see things. So how will we move forward with thinking about where to go? Do, do we need, we obviously need more time. So what would be our next step considering, you know, what you're saying, Aubrey? And, and all we've learned here, like what would be our, like I'm good at making a step. I sometimes cannot see far down a year from now, but I can see, I can take a next step. So can we come up with something like just one step? So well, this if I, a, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. We always envision this as a two phase process at the very oh, least. Okay. So this is the reflection piece in January, we're gonna do a visioning piece. And um, if Mich Michelle has agreed to continue on that journey with us, as long as we can secure resources to carry on, um, we've got enough for a second session with her in January, but I can, I mean, this is, for me, it's a lifetime journey. And for the Food Policy Council, I, I think it's also, that's the case. I was just gonna say, so if anybody else wants to speak, 
uh, let me know right away. Um, I just have one thing to yes. add, Michelle. And this is yep. a, just an aside. Um, young agrarians received funding from the Real Estate Foundation of BC to work with Kinshift, an Indigenous-led organization, to offer um, settlers and farmers the opportunity to join in for workshops with Kinshift and led by Kinshift. Um, we're able to offer people in our network um, through that funding um, a code to get it reimbursed by 50% or 90% for those that are interested in joining. And I'm just going to put the link in the chat um, has information about the four part workshops led by Kinshift, um, elements of truth before reconciliation. And if you are interested in attending those, just send me an email um, and I can send you one of the codes that we have through Young Agrarians um, for people to lower the barrier to access those workshops. Is that place based, Haley, or is that an Indigenous broad stroke? Um, well, it's it's based in BC. I do believe it's um, an organization, I think, that started in the Okanagan or led by Indigenous people in the Okanagan, um, but it's being offered to people all across British Columbia. Okay. Okay, thanks. There, I'm, I was asking only because I'm finding a lot, a lot more um, of these organizations are coming up and, and I think it's a great start. However, a lot of the approaches are still incredibly assimilative because they are now using the Canadian de uh, definition of what Indigenous is, which now is what we used to be called when we were Indians mm -hmm. and that hasn't shifted. And so that's why I was asking. Right? Is is it is it place based? Is it um, you know is it is it getting to that place where it's going to enable those conversations to happen? Because one of the things in where we live in is there is a strategic regional competition underway right now, very similar to the Middle East, where we have the Sunaiks, the Silks, and the Tanaka in conflict because of the colonial system, where there is now a fight over what lines and who and what and how, right? And so, and that is something that I talk about because it's true, right? And when you look at the Middle East, for example, if you look at the Middle Eastern history, history, and you go back as far as even, because I was raised Catholic, so I go to the, the Old Testament and I go to stories of the Old Testament where people went to communal wells, right? And if you look at the old movie, The Ten Commandments, right? How does Moses meet his wife? He defends her and her sisters at the communal well because people are coming in and taking water. So the Middle East, the conflicts in the Middle East were not religious to start with. They were over access to landscapes and waterways through the transformation from tribes, right? From place-based people to that universal Middle East. These are, this is the level of conversation we haven't had in Canada. We're about 3000 years behind that conflict. But we see that conflict in places like Witzowatin. We see those conflicts in Oka. We see those conflicts in, in place and in, in moments, right? In, in isolation. And we see those conflicts in Tanaka homelands as well, right now, right? We saw it with, with Gatmuk. We know it's happening with the Columbia River Treaty, right? There is now another proposed, because they didn't get Gatmuk, they've now moved a little bit north. Right, there's a, there's a proposed resort a little bit north and in the mountains there, and it goes on either side of the lakes. Runoff is gonna go into the Kootenai Lake and the Arrow Lakes from any sort of development in that space. But we can't even have the conversation yet because we're still arguing about, well, this is my land and this is your land and da 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 da, da right? So anyway, that's a whole other aside. Um, so we're at one o'clock. I, I thank you very much, all of you, for your time and effort. I don't know if anyone, normally what I do is, is go through and we have a closing round as well. Uh, and we will do that next time because we will be having a second session. 
Uh, if you have ideas, uh, it's not just today and you can't think of it anymore, because uh, I know you will, you will think about it again, uh, to please send your comments to, are we sending them to Amy or to, I, I think we would like to send them to Amy to send to me. And Abra, I'm doing that because I know that you're, uh, you're, you're a participant in here. And so I'm going to respect what you told me and be the boss of this and say, please send your comments to Amy, who's the communications coordinator, and she will send them to me. And then we'll be able to work on what that next session looks like. I just want to acknowledge, um, I have gotten the benefit and pleasure to work with some really, really amazing leadership like Abra. And what I find always happens is that we, right, we give the busiest people the most stuff to do because they get it done. But we also have to recognize that we've got to share it, share it out. So uh, if anybody, yeah, Amy just put her uh, email address in there. Anybody have anything that they wish to say before we go? Carol, so honored to participate in this session with every, thank you, thank you. This was not at all what I expected and has given me a lot to think about. Well, hopefully that's a good thing. Yes, okay, good. Anybody wanna say anything? Patrick, do you want to as the chair, as the? I, I don't have more to add at this time, but I, I'm really glad we're engaged in this process and I'm, I'm glad that you're part of it. I think it's been a, 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 like Annika, it's not what I was expecting. I have a lot to think about. I, I can't wait to review the, uh, the recording of this because there's so much to, to go through that, that, uh, that was inspirational to me. Thanks. So I don't like plugging myself, but I do have a podcast that started. Uh, it's called Tanaka Her Stories. You can find it on Spotify and Transistor. There's only five up there right now. It's just the beginning, just because I, I can't figure out how to how to pay myself to be able to do it. Because <laughs> everything's fine, right? Like I'm still trying to. Anyways, there's a long story behind that of being a small business owner. Um, and so, yeah, Tanaka Her Stories, it's on, it's on those if you want to start listening to that. Uh, there is the paper. Um, uh, that was offered in the chat there. And uh, there's lots of, if you Google me, you'll come to my business site. If you Google me, you'll come to old videos um, and stuff like that to, to be hearing all the different ideas. So for now, uh, that's it for now. And we'll see you again. <laughs>